Blog Talk Radio. Hello and welcome to Virtues of Peace. My name is Hope Elizabeth May and I am joined by Taylor Ackerman. Hello. Michael Buzzy. Hello, everyone. And Randy Olson. Hello, hello. So we are all back. And today's show is called Justice, Impartiality, and Peace from Andrew Carnegie to John Lewis. This show does continue a dialogue that we began last week, which was itself a continuation of an earlier show. But basically what we have been trying to do um, is mark a moment, uh, so the end of August, uh, which is a, a confluence of many important dates related to peace history, um, mark a moment and also get clear on some concepts, some ideas. And where we ended last week was really with um, trying to distinguish or understand the connections between, or I should say among, the golden rule, peace, justice, and we just very briefly touched on impartiality. I mean, each of these concepts, <laughs> you, you could spend your life um, researching and, and studying, and so we're just trying to get clear in um, this hour-long conversation. But let me just go back to a little bit about the show last week, and then we're going to return to this quote by Andrew Carnegie. This is on our show resources page, um, and it's a quote from 1907. We'll get to it in a moment. But basically, um, last week, we noted, and we're going to be bringing up this connection again, this connection between John Lewis and Albert Bigelow. Today, we're talking about John Lewis and Andrew Carnegie. All of these individuals are connected. But the connection with Albert Bigelow is that both John Lewis and Albert Bigelow um, participated in the Freedom Rides, which were part of the nonviolent movement towards racial justice and equality. And Albert Bigelow um, sailed a small sailboat called the Golden Rule to protest the nuclear testing in the Marshall Islands. So we're going to come back to him at the end, but just to remind everyone and also the, the other hosts on the call where we were. And so I'm going to go to this quote by Carnegie. Um, and I, if I recall, where we ended was um, discussing this connection between justice and impartiality. And so basically in this quote uh, from 1907, Andrew Carnegie who, again, um, is responsible for the Peace Palace in The Hague, which we talked about several times. Um, And he's responsible for many other pieces and uh, entities still contributing to this day towards um, peace and justice. And I would argue that Carnegie Hall in New York is one of those other pieces in this architecture that he has bequeathed to us. But he says that the first, like it's like a first principle of natural justice, is to not be a judge in one's own case. Um, so I'll just quote the exact language: the first principle of natural justice forbids men to be judges when they are parties to the issue. And this is done, uh, Andrew Carnegie makes this claim because uh, earlier that year uh, at another convention, someone made the claim that justice is higher than peace. And this is something that we talked about last week as well. Uh, Is there a hierarchy of values? Is justice going to be incompatible with peace? 
And Carnegie here seems to think that they're they're not incompatible with peace, that peace with justice is secured, as he claims, by arbitration. Um, <clears throat> and I'll just stop there and open it up to anyone if they want to continue filling out uh, this this bit that we were talking about last week. Yeah, I will say um, one of the things we we wrestled with kind of was um, the idea of you know can you have justice without peace and can you have peace uh, can you have peace without justice and I I mm-hmm. I want to echo one idea that I think I've heard over and over again in sort of the international justice space, which is that justice and peace are two sides of the same coin. Mm-hmm. And so it presents these interesting questions about, um, you know, what should be prioritized. But at the end of the day, I think when we push forward for justice or we push forward for peace, we are ultimately also pushing for justice and peace yeah. as a whole. Yeah. Thanks for that. And um, and other shows, you know, uh, I, I think I have, and I know that Randy has quoted Jane Addams' definition of peace as the unfoldment of worldwide processes making for the nurture of human life. So there's this idea of like peace has some like content to it. And she doesn't use the word justice. Um, and I thought we might get to this quote later, later um, in the show. But uh, Martin Luther King Jr. also talks about um, justice, pe- peace as the presence of justice. He says that in the letter from Birmingham jail, that peace is the presence of justice positive peace and he makes this claim that the quote white moderate has this view that peace is just the absence of conflict so taylor your comment there is in this tradition of recognizing this relationship this intimate relationship um, between peace and justice as you said there's two sides of the same coin and i also want to say that um that sentiment is really like if you go into the the early drafts of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, that is clearly stated. It didn't make it into the final draft, but um, in the early drafts of the Declaration, the, the claims are – they don't use the word justice, but they say human rights, which, of course, connected to all of this. Right? Um, but that peace cannot – it doesn't exist without – respect for human rights and that has something to do with justice okay so yeah i think where we are today right is understanding that there is this intimate connection between peace and justice and um it's interesting because in 1907 andrew carnegie and i I think he if i recall he's responding to theodore roosevelt who makes the claim that justice is higher than peace um, and Carnegie is saying no, and he gives his little argument. Um, but yeah, I think I think that's where we are today. That we've sort of like woken up to the fact that what we're working towards is not simply the absence of conflict, but the presence of something that involves human rights and justice. Anybody else? Well. I'll, I'll make a brief, uh, brief comment that you know. Last week, I was defending a position that actually put these in a, you know, in a hierarchy, and I, I, I really, I'm operating from a belief that peace exists in a layer of abstraction that's above justice. It's a more, it's, it's ideal in a way that justice isn't. Like. In, uh, it, it's difficult to actually unpack where and how and exactly why, but it seems like peace for me is this more abstract idea that you need to implement using tools of justice. And I don't know if that's true or not, but that's what I was arguing for yes or last week, and I intend mm. to continue that thread today. Mm. And I, I, I'll just throw in that I think that justice is also an ideal. <laughs> I think these these are things that you're you know you you work towards both things and to just like throw in another piece um, and this I think will <clears throat> take us to some some clips soon. But what we've also said and how we began this discussion 
was this like importance of inner work, right? So um, you have this work for peace. You have this work for justice. Peace seems to be more abstract. Maybe justice is less abstract. Maybe if we're talking about, quote, the legal conception of justice, which is not the only conception of justice, and it's not the conception of justice that Plato puts forth in in the Republic. And probably that's the earliest treatise, right? Lengthy treatise on justice is is the Republic. Um, And we've also said, like, whatever it is, it starts with, an individual. And so maybe like this thing that the individual is working on is not obtainable. And this thing in society that we're working on is not obtainable. Um, Anybody else on that? I really liked Taylor's notion of justice and peace are one side of the same coin in that this very interesting way of thinking that, you know, like peace for some individuals is like the presence of justice where they feel, you know, within their societal context, um, there is sort of ideal of justice that will set things right if everyone feels wrong. And then this other really, con- like I know last show we had talked about the concept of blowback in the political science realm and that, if justice is carried out in more of a dictatorial fashion, like laying down um, results to cases and stuff on either side, that one side's justice can be another side's injustice. And then you're yeah. stuck in this cyclical process and then peace is not achievable in that sense. So you know, I really liked Taylor's notion of that. Yeah. And there, I think we, we were talking about justice, as a kind of penalty. Um, When you're talking about the concept of blowback, it seems to imply a very specific definition of justice, which is like you are punishing, um, or at least there's some sort of discomfort administered. Is that that accurate, or am I I mishearing the uh, concept here about blowback? Okay. Yeah. That. And so, yeah, and I think last week we we um we noted that that's not the only and I think Taylor also talked about some some other approaches to justice um that that don't involve punishment in that way in the way that like the western liberal criminal law uh approach to justice. Um so just bracket that. Um, so that's like one aspect of justice. Like we want, we want someone to pay. Um, there needs to be payback. Um, and I, I'm going to say that 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 idea of justice is challenged very much so by Plato, um, like so before Christianity. And uh, maybe we'll, we'll we'll get to that, but. Um, to continue this thread, I'm going to play a clip. Uh, so what we're talking about is, um, you know, the the role of the individual and the individual work and whatever it is that we're talking about, peace and justice. And so when we're talking about justice as like punishment, and, and we also remember, okay, so like this involves the work of the individual as well. Like, what does that look like? That's one question. But I'm going to play a clip from from John Lewis, actually, um, who talks about the inner work that's required for peace. Okay, so here it comes. This is John Lewis. And um This is from an interview from 1998, and you can access it on our show resources page. In the chapter, Peace, at the end, and we've got just a couple of minutes, I want to read a paragraph that you wrote and um, ask you how effective you think it is to get people to read this. I ask you to reach down inside yourself and find the truth your life is compelling you to see. That is your road to true peace, and it is the beginning of the evolution of humankind. 
because every change in the world starts within. It begins with one individual who envisions his or her micro-universe the way it can be and settles for nothing less. And as one individual moves toward the light, that light ignites more individual flames, and eventually the revolutionary inner work becomes a transformative outer work that builds into a bonfire of light, the kind of light that can change the world. I believe that. I believe that one, one solitary individual committed to the way of peace, the way of love, the way of nonviolence, can change others, a community, a nation, a world. You have to, you know, we used to sing a little song during the movement, this little light of mine. Let it shine. I'm going to let it shine. We have to let our little light shine. Not just in our little room, yes. Not just on Capitol Hill, yes. But in the larger world. And that's what we must do as a nation. Somehow we got to humanize our politics. Just be human. Humanize our institution. It's hard. It's difficult. For elected officials to say, you know, I love you. Many of my uh, colleagues in the Congress, I think people think it's strange sometimes. I refer to them as brother. Hi, my brother. How you doing, my brother? How you doing, sister? Because I see ourselves as a family. And we have to be examples to the larger nation, to the American community, and to the world. So that is John Lewis talking with Brian Lamb. You can watch the entire, it's actually a video, and we just you know, took the audio from it on our show resources page, virtuesofpeace.com. Brian Lamb, by the way, was the person who um, envisioned C-SPAN um, many years ago. He's, a, he's an institution himself. He's great. But uh, John Lewis says we have to imagine like we are a family. And I know people think I'm strange because I call my fellow congresspersons brother, sister, etc. And and this the sort of we're going to come back to we have some other clips as well, but this kind of image of uh, like we have to imagine that we're a family and we have to act thusly um, also raises questions about punishment and administering pain for, quote, justice. Uh, He doesn't use that word. He's talking about peace. He talks about inner work. But the image here of a family, I think, helps us to maybe navigate a little bit um, this this different conception of justice. um, Because, I don't know, do we think about, like, if if a family member does something wrong, do we think about hurting them back or giving them pain or do we try to understand and and help or do or do something differently i just leave it open Uh, I'll, i'll comment on that because i was in a position where i had to administer justice in this way rather recently um you know one of the one of the children was uh very uh, defiantly holding on to the sour gummy worms that were covered in sugar and <laughs> the uh, yeah so the issue was removing the sour gummy worms was interpreted by the child as a punishment but mm-hmm. when you know from a different perspective it's like no we're we're taking something away and mm-hmm. even though you're experiencing negative emotion it's no it's not a punishment nor is it painful Mm. So this, I'm just adding this layer in with a visual to point out that like, just because one person can identify something as painful doesn't mean it is, right? We have to get into some very serious definitions of things. And, mm. you know, a lot of the time it's pretty obvious when something is a punishment, when it's painful. But, you know, if we're going to talk about using nonviolent means to, you know, in- enact 
some form of justice into the world, we have to be willing to do things that somebody might not like, even mm-hmm. if it isn't directly painful, like a bludgeon or a cudgel or something. And I think, uh, you know, in other clips, um, John Lewis says, um, you have to be willing to take pain, um, like physical pain, but you don't, you don't interpret it as simply, you know, thuggery, um, but you interpret this as sort of necessary to move towards what he's going to, you know, call a revolution. We talked about this last week, a revolution of values or a revolution of consciousness. So, and this goes back to the clip that we played by um, by Lema Bowie, where um, these women who were working for peace in Liberia say, like, I need to, like, take this pain so that my community is at peace. Um, so there's that aspect as well to the, this connection between pain and justice. Anybody else? Yeah, going off of the idea about pain and, and justice, it really goes into that inner work and being able to take that pain. Um, mm-hmm. I think it's, like, very different, you know, especially, I think, in politics, um, to kind of, like, quiet your ego and, you know, call someone who you disagree with vehemently brother um, and to, like, humanize <laughs> politics. You know, to humanize politics really requires work, making sure that you yourself are, you know, fully human fully human um, mm. and have humanized yourself. And so I, it's really, I think his, this clip in particular really um, explains the connection between the inner work that one does and the external mm. movement of peace and how important that inner work is. Mm. And um, I want to add in a quote from a Bertha von Sutner, um, who says, and she's talking about suffrage, interestingly, but she says the best reason for women's suffrage is that politics can only develop into a state worthy of our progressing civilization if the essentially female qualities of gentleness and dignity would penetrate political life. Um, And I just add this gloss um, so this more like humane family uh, dimension that John Lewis is talking about. Also, Bertha says, you know, we have to bring gentleness and dignity into political life. And she calls that essentially female, just pointing that out. And Taylor, your point is that to like before that happens, you have to yeah do this inner work. Um, which, yes, I think it's something we have stressed. <laughs> and it's something that needs to be stressed repeatedly. Um, yeah. a- any Anybody else on that? Yeah, I really loved what John Lewis had to say. And I think you can even apply it in, a, in just like a very relevant context currently if anyone is a follower of international relations and politics, you would know that the intra-Afghan peace talks between the Taliban and the Afghan government are set to begin in Qatar on Saturday. And I had received a a news notification this afternoon from an American news outlet that was kind of bashing a, they had asked the celebrity their take on the peace talks and how they would handle it. And the celebrity pretty much said something to the extent of, I would approach Taliban leaders coming to the peace talks with love. I would approach this from a very human Mm. sense and, you know, not this justice Mm. equaling pain that we had talked about before. And the news Mm. organization was kind of bashing the celebrity for that, that that's anti-American. How could you, you know, dare Mm. love or treat individuals like this with any sort of degree of respect or human dignity? And it was just, and then to hear the uh, quote from John Lewis, it's just this very, you know, coming to the table Mm. with an open heart, seeing the whole of humanity as a related family. And I think it also speaks to a lot of like to the concept of restorative justice as well, that, you know, if you are to punish these individuals who are coming to the table to talk and, you know, seek 
retribution from them in some way that you would only further the cycle of violence and you would not put any forward motion of peace whatsoever. Mm. And it's also the case that some people like uh, may not understand uh, that is, you know, other civilians, why you don't punish, why you are doing this with, uh, you know, open arms and that itself also perpetuates violence. So, so much work has to be done by by all people to yeah, understand where this this is coming from. And I'm going to play an, another clip by John Lewis. And I referred to this clip last week, where um, it's in the same interview with Brian Lamb from 1998. Again, the whole thing is on our show resources page at virtuesofpeace.com. And um, Stokely Carmichael, who we briefly mentioned last week, um, was. Uh, part of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, but um, he did not, as John Lewis says, embrace nonviolence as a way of life, but only as a political tactic. And this is one of the disagreements between John Lewis and Stokely Carmichael. Um, And there are people who do advocate, quote, violence in, quote, you know, the revolution. And so in this clip, you have... Uh, Brian Lamb playing John Lewis a uh, a conversation that Brian Lamb had with Stokely Carmichael, where uh, Stokely Carmichael is definitely advocating violence, and John Lewis responds to it. So it's about two minutes long. How far would you go with violence to bring about the revolution? All the way. All the way. All what's, the way. That, what's that mean? Uh, whatever's necessary. Whatever's necessary. Uh, in terms of carrying out uh, to destroy the enemy, whatever. Uh, what will you say that vi- the revolution is coming? When will it? Don't know. That's the only trouble. But it's coming. And what will happen when it comes? Oh, when it comes, there's going to be a real, uh, real experience of genuine equality and democracy. There's going to be a clear understanding of the needs that uh, humanity must be at all times and all conditions be concerned about advancing humanity and that all human beings who are involved in uh, this aspect of life must make a contribution to advance humanity. And there is no question that this is what's going to happen. John Lewis, when you gave the speech over at the Lincoln Memorial in 1963, you said the following, the revolution is at hand, and we must free ourselves of the chains of political and economic slavery. Define the two revolutions we're talking about here. When, When I speak of revolution, I'm talking about a revolution of values, a revolution of ideas. And I speak in terms of nonviolence. That revolution must take place in the hearts, in the minds, in the souls of people, not a revolution in the streets. See, I believe that you cannot separate means and ends. Means and ends are inseparable. If you're striving to create a beloved community, an open society, if that is the goal, if that is the end, then the means, the methods must be one of love, one of peace. Uh, what Stokely is talking about is, is nonsense. It is crazy. Um, he's dreaming. The great majority of the American people, and I believe the great majority of the people of the world, want to live in a world community at peace with itself. I think it is the desire of humankind not to go down that violent path. We, we're seeing what violence would do. It's too much violence. There's been too many killings. It, it leads to chaos, not to, to the, a sense of community, not to the, the building of a house that is together. Hmm. Anybody want to respond to that? Yeah, I would just say I think, you know, when we're talking about the idea of the the revolution being this revolution of ideas, it really goes to the idea of the inner work and Mm -hmm. being the light that he talked about in the first clip and showing that light as well. Mm -hmm. Um, You can't just do the inner work because so many people, when we talk about self-care, we talk about people, you know, there's like this kind of this idea of like inner enlightenment, but that inner enlightenment doesn't really work if we're not willing to, share that and to um, 
and like society as a whole kind of has to reach that next level of enlightenment. And that's really what I think he's talking about, about um, when it, Mm. you know, moving past and everyone realizing that they're and it becoming mainstream that, you know, there have been, you know, there's been racism and there's been uh, xenophobia and that there's been violence and we need to find these ways and change our systems to change, to change it. And um, Mm -hmm. I think it's just so radical because when we often think about revolution, we think about wars and we think about civil, um, civil conflicts, um, especially nowadays. But um, throughout history, we also kind of have seen like the revolution being used, the word in um, these very Mm -hmm. powerful ways. Mm -hmm. Um, So. Mm And, So I'd like to I'd like to mention that you know if a person is taking personal development seriously and they're trying to really work on themselves and develop that in, that inner that inner entity whatever that is call it soul call it something else there comes a point where the person has to eventually start to work on the external world as <laughs> part of that path as part of that development there's no way around it Right, like, and one of the one of the, the prerequisites is going to inevitably be that you need to be able to, you know, walk the walk and not just talk the mm. talk. Mm. And so, like, that's part of the inner growth. That's part of the inner development. And so, if you concentrate on the inner stuff and you're really doing that seriously, then you're not going to get to a place where you're trying to change the external world until it's obvious that that's the thing you have to do, which is why it's like a safe strategy in some sense. Yeah, and uh, going back to John Lewis, um, you know, he's very religious, and the sort of like uh, like an aha moment for him in this process is uh, like he knows, you know, he knows the Bible, and he's taught this sort of like, this idea about how human beings should be with each other. And then he looks out into the world as a child and he sees that is not the case. Um, He sees a disconnect. It is a contradiction between, you know, the word and the actuality. So that's piece number one. And then piece number two, he hears the words of Martin Luther King when he's 15 years old and he hears the way of nonviolence um, and so forth. And I'm going to play the last clip that I have of John Lewis now because I think, you know, so crucial to, to, to like, working in the world um, is, you know, an image and also working on yourself, but especially when you start to, like, work in the world as part of this, you have to have an image of what it is you're trying to make. Um, And John Lewis in this clip says that this is like one of the core differences between between him and, and Stokely Carmichael, that they're just imagining a different end, a different goal, a different reality. Uh, this is about a minute and a half. What would you say is the difference between the two of you and your philosophies today? Today, I'm a believer. I am a believer in an interracial democracy. I believe in the idea of the beloved community. Uh, I believe that we must lay down the burden of race. I believe in integration. Uh, I believe that integration, like nonviolence, is one of those immutable principles that you cannot deviate from. Um, I I believe in America. I, I believe that we got to have coalition politics. We cannot divide the American house. We got to keep this house together and build one house, one community, one family. Uh, and I don't think Stokely share that. Uh, Stokely is not a believer in any philosophy and a discipline of nonviolence. I believe in it as a way of life, as a way of living, um, not just as a means, not just as a technique. And I think some people, like Stokely and others, use it only as a means, only as a technique. And when that happens, it's just like a faucet. You can turn it on and you can turn it off. You have to choose today if you're going to hate somebody today, and love somebody tomorrow. Uh, but when you accept nonviolence as a way of life, as a way of living, 
then everything that you do and everything that you say is governed by that principle. Hmm. So in the in the earlier clip with Stokely Carmichael, uh, he does say that like the goal is this you know, equal world of humanity. I forgot the exact language that he uses. He doesn't use the term that John Lewis uses all the time, beloved community, truly interracial democracy. Um, so Stokely Carmichael in, in that clip earlier uses, you know, this more abstract term, if you will. So it's not clear that they're, they are focused on the, the, the different ends but I think what is clear is that, you know, this, this point about tactics. Um, and I want to, you know, also mention this other, other quote by Bertha von Sutner. And she says this right after um, the quote that I read about gentleness and dignity um, being necessary for political life. Right after that, she says, it seems to me that the violent methods presently adopted are most unsuitable because they lack the above-mentioned qualities. Means should never be less noble, less beautiful than the end. So I uh, I open it up for any comments. I, I think like what's interesting, especially, sorry to go back to that revolution trip, and then the idea of <laughs> looking at a different end um, and mm. means to the end is really violence is like run of the mill it is society right like we talk about systemic violence we talk about war we're talking about all sorts of um issues in our society and really violence are is at the core of so much of it and and power struggles of, mm. and of coming from a place of violence and anger and greed um mm. whereas this idea of a nonviolent revolution this idea of the end you want are so radically different that it makes sense that the revolution would not come about in a way of violence, but would come out uh, in a way of sort of mental clarity and and a political, kind of a more political um, thought revolution. Um, Because Mm -hmm. honestly, violence is just everywhere. So Mm -hmm. adding violence doesn't add anything new. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? I think I build upon, go ahead. Thank you, Randy. To build upon Taylor's point that the vision of John Lewis and Martin Luther King Jr. and Stokely Carmichael, like their means were just so radically different. But in a way, they're both trying to influence the wider populace to, you know, sort of recognize the injustice that is being enacted upon this racial minority in the country. And that through Stokely Carmichael's vision of this, you know, elaborate, violent, completely just chaotic revolution that would occur, you are not giving those individuals who you're trying to influence the space or sort of the clarity under which they could go that under which they could take that personal work, that inner revolution for themselves. Mm. And if anything, Mm. through the violent revolution, you would just be further hardening their resolve and Mm. further entrenching them in their current opinions and trying to open them up to a new way, way of thinking. Whereas, John Lewis's and Martin Luther King's Jr.'s approach of love everybody, you know, regardless <laughs> of that, to sort of get them to undergo this process of self-reflection and to undergo that internal revolution is definitely different for sure. You know, we, we've we talked about this in the past and, you know, it's, it's it comes from a Gandhi quote where it's like, you know, <laughs> seeds for violence are are planted, or every time you use violence to solve a dispute, you plant the seeds for future violence. It's something like that, and you know, it's it seems pretty obvious that if you want to create something, you have to start by acting it out, and you can't like imagine that the universe doesn't play by that rule. And the universe, obviously, inside of that is society <laughs> and the world we live in. So it's like I I want a peaceful world where everybody gets along that has to start at the scale of, okay, well, I'm going to treat myself in a way that's peaceful where everybody gets along, not violently. And Mm -hmm. then I'm going to start to treat the people around me in a way that's peaceful in a way that everybody gets along. Now, 
so I mean, it, it, in some sense, it's it's like it's it's obviously the true way forward. The the position that John Lewis's uh, clip presents, um, and I, I want to stress that that's actually much much harder than it sounds. Mm-hmm. Because we all have our reasons to hate ourselves and to be violent and to hate each other and to mm-hmm. like those are there are real reasons they're not they're not just arbitrary and mm-hmm. so overcoming those with a higher perspective with a form of internal observation and a form of forgiveness and acceptance all of the things that are nested within that peaceful framework that's the real hard work and I really believe mm-hmm. that. If people aren't willing to do that and they're trying to change the external world without changing the internal world, they're actually just avoiding the real problem. They're afraid of something. That's my that's my feeling. Mhm. Yeah, I think I think you said in an earlier show like like becoming better is hard work. You said something like that, and and I I, I absolutely second that. And um, <clears throat> I mean. Um, you, you, you talked about sort of not committing violence to yourself um, and not committing violence to other people. And um, at least where I am these days, you know, after, after studying, you know, these ideas and, and teaching these ideas, um, which, as I've mentioned, goes back to ancient Greek philosophy, um, you know the the will, if you will, <laughs> perhaps we'll, we'll, we'll squeeze Kant in in here somehow. Uh, you can commit all sorts of violence against yourself, and there's no quote physical. Well, maybe there is because you can, you know, it gets physically ill. But are are there's this thing of like I can get away with it, right? Like. If I'm not listening to myself, well, no one's noticing that. Only I can witness myself not listening to myself. And I'm, quote, getting away with it. And this goes back to um, this quote from Hamsa Khan that the worst crime that you can commit is the crime against yourself. Now, here, here's a little little Kant, if I, I can fit him in, um, um, so Kant in some earlier shows not on virtues of peace but ethics talk when we were reviving this series of dialogues we did a couple of shows on like the duties to oneself and what it means to violate them and actually that remains a very popular downloaded conversation by the way which which says to me that people out there we're not just talking about people in the United States have this sense of like they have duties to themselves and they're violating them. Um, otherwise, like why would people be downloading that that particular podcast more than others? And and they are, which I find very curious. So number one, they're like duties to ourselves, and number two, we violate them. And is this is this violence? Do we call this violent? Um, and uh, Kant says. And this this is the connection also to impartiality that <clears throat> we're, try, we're trying to make that we made last time with justice and Carnegie's quote. He says, and this is from a book that he wrote called The Doctrine of Virtue. You can find this on our show resources page. This particular quote that I'm about to read is actually quoted in another book called Making a Necessity of Virtue by Nancy Sherman. And as luck would have it, that page of her book is available through like Google books or something that single page is and so if you go to our show resources page it'll take you to one book and one page where this quote i'm about to read appears but it is from kant's doctrine of virtue we can't publish the whole thing because it's copyright he says impartiality in judging oneself in comparison with the law and sincerity in avowing to oneself one's inner moral worth or unworth are duties to oneself that follow immediately from that first command of self-knowledge. So there's this primary duty, that's end quote, there's this primary duty of self-knowledge. And then once you like have that duty and you take it seriously, then you have 
a duty to be impartial in judging yourself and sincere about your true worth, which he's going to say like the true measure of your value is not how you compare to other people out there. No. Your true measure of value is the extent to which you are obeying the inner law. He also calls it the inner judge. And that he says that, uh, he, he seems to say here that it's possible to do that. Elsewhere, he, he questions whether you can really know your own motivations. But I just want to throw in there that there's this whole other like piece of philosophy that's really important. We've, we've talked about this before. As I've said, it's a popularly downloaded show that um, it starts with yourself. It starts with being a friend to yourself, whatever that means. And by the way, that's also in Plato. Um, and Plato defines justice in that way as like you are a true friend to yourself, and that's what justice is. And they're not committing violence against your voice. Um, and that's really where the revolution has to be. But that's, you know, like 2,000 years ago, these ideas. <laughs> and Kant, Kant picks it up later, but but it's all there. Um, so, yeah. Uh, and that, that, as you said, Randy, is hard. It's not like it's easy and those people who aren't doing that and who are focused um, just on like the outside, maybe there's, you know, some hypocrisy. I don't know. That's also a, a popular, a popular notion that's bandied about um, in, in these works. So I'll stop. Well, I'll start. No, <laughs> no I, <laughs> I I really want to emphasize a, a few useful uh, hinges in this set of mm. ideas um, mm-hmm. because like we could we could take this conversation in a whole bunch of different directions and and one that I think is useful to keep in mind is when we're talking about the inner world we need to identify the subject that we're describing. In, other, in, in order for language to make any sense. Um, this is a, it's a point Nietzsche makes more carefully than I'm going to, but it's <laughs> like, okay, we're talking about the inner world. Well, what exactly are we referring to? Mm-hmm. And there's, a, there's an idea in William James uh, in his essay, Will to Believe, where he identifies that you have to take a leap of faith towards an idea. And once you do... The truth of that mm. belief or the falsehood of it becomes part of your life in a way that's undeniable. And so when we're talking about this inner world, if we presume at the onset that there is something that we can identify as our identity as an internal judge, as an arbiter, as the soul or the spirit or something like that, we can put a different noun label on there. Mm-hmm. Once you assume that it's there, mm-hmm. then you can actually have the conversation as to whether it's doing good uh, and whether you can evaluate it and stuff like that. But a lot of questions, like a lot of conversations about this get just totally hung up on, well, I don't know if there's anything actually in there or not. It's like, yeah, I, of course. It's because there's a faith-based argument and you have to play the game. Otherwise, it, the rules don't make sense. So that's one important point. And I'll pause, but then I, there's more. Okay. Cool. I wonder. Sorry. I'll also start now. Um, I'm wondering when we like, when we're thinking about like violence against oneself, um, and how mm. that translates to is that really violence? I think it's mm. so important to recognize. You know, we've talked about this inner work over and over again because it's so important to peace, in part because we're all so interconnected as a species and society Mm. that if you are neglecting yourself, you are neglecting your duties to others, right? So your duties Mm. to yourself are often associated with your duties to others. And Mm. I know recently having been like ill and whatnot, I I noticed how much my inability to um, get my own work done impacted other people, right? So it's very clear that when you're being violent to yourself and you're not getting, doing what you need to do for yourself, um, you know, getting your work done, doing the things that you say you're going to do, you're going to start neglecting your duties to other people, and that in turn causes harm. So I, 
it's so easy to say, oh, it's just myself, but I think it, it causes, you know, violence beyond oneself. And maybe, you know, it is yourself. I mean, there are views of, like, the intersubjectivity of the self that um, we, like, but for other people, we wouldn't even have a sense of self. So, um, you know, there's a there's a literature on, on that that dates back pretty far. So there's also this question of, like, well, is there a separate thing or is it totally dependent on, um, you know, this intersubjectivity? Cool. Yes. Um <clears throat> And I, that, that what you're saying there also goes back to the Hamsak Han quote where he says, you know, all all crimes flow from the crime against oneself. So another way of understanding that is like all harms flow from the harm against oneself. Anybody else? So uh, I, I can keep building. So <laughs> sorry. Uh, um, <laughs> so. One of the things that gets really cool is once there is an internal entity that we've identified and given a label to that we call something approaching our higher self or, you know, our soul or something like that, once that's there, one of the things that automatically starts to happen is there's this split between that thing and our personality and our persona and all of these other parts of ourselves. And we start to differentiate and have to begin to discriminate between the different parts of ourselves and the psychoanalysts have done a really good job of kind of parsing out all of the useful subcategories of that. But one of the things that's most useful is the, I, the part of ourselves, whatever that is inside, that's able to pay attention to things and distribute attention amongst the various components of our being. Mm-hmm. If we put that part at the top of our personal value hierarchy and always take that thing seriously – one of the things that we begin to be able to do is identify precisely when we do or say something that we know is wrong or that we know is not true. And we start to use labels, like we use the word conscience, to refer to that precise event. And when you start to listen to yourself doing things that are wrong, because for whatever reason, I don't know why, but that voice of conscience only – only operates in the negative, mm-hmm. which is very bizarre. That. But, mm-hmm. but like, then, then there's this clear mechanism through which you can identify the inner work that needs to be done based on what you keep catching yourself lying about and being afraid to do. So, you know, <laughs> if, we're so, if we're so bent on killing the people who don't agree with us, like, I feel like we're pretty <laughs> far away from like paying attention to the internal voice that's saying not to do certain things, right? There's like this big gap between those two operational paradigms and where the attention is and how the blame is getting distributed. It's like totally different world. I I also wonder, like, you know, when we look at, sorry to jump in again, but when we look at like what John Lewis was saying, he was talking about doing that inner work in his clips. Um, he wasn't talking about comparing yourself to every other person or looking at like mm. society's checklist for yourself and how important it is to be kind of guided by oneself and not just sort of societal expectations and social media. And I think it's especially powerful, like looking at this idea of impartiality um, to look at it from oneself and to do the work that Ra- Randy is talking about, not from um, social media or Facebook Um, and Mm -hmm. even though there's this discussion about a revolution and this thought revolution I think a thought revolution um, doesn't necessarily isn't necessarily only going to be on social media it does require people to actually look internally and not just at Mm -hmm. the comparisons and what is everyone else doing because that's not going to be a true revolution if people aren't examining themselves yeah and Kant says um, it's it's also in this doctrine of virtue work that uh, he doesn't use the phrase. I think no, he does use the phrase self esteem or self respect. Um, true, and he makes a distinction between true self respect and you know inauthentic uh, or he uses the word pathological, like pathological self respect. Um, <clears throat> And that's when your value is being sourced 
by other people's opinions of you, where in fact the true source of value is only between you and your inner law, which, by the way, he says is the same for everyone. <laughs> so, good news, folks. Um, if we're all listening to it, well, <laughs> we're going to agree. <laughs> so, it says the same thing for everyone, um, and it, it it's as long as you're, as he says, impartial and sincere, and you've got this going on, and, and, and you can, like, this is the other, like, can we? And there are passages where he says it's not clear whether you can know your own motivation. I said that before, but, but uh, yeah, I just want to say that's, that's kind of a revolution, isn't it? That, um, that my, my value, I can, only, I can only like source my value from whether or not I'm, I'm complying with my, my inner law. And uh, I'll just I'll just add why like why not I'm letting the chinchillas out now, <laughs> so, um, like a, a like a the notion of parasitism I think is is very apt here, um, and that if you are yeah getting your value from other people, you're a parasite, um, and and the goal is to not be a parasite and to be like self sufficient, um, and there's something inside of you. That's the proper thing to be getting your sense of worth from. And Kant definitely, you know, says this is in every person. This is what human dignity has to do with. But the problem is there's so much noise. And as I also say, as some of you know, uh, we're all drunk. <laughs> so, uh, we have a case of drunk parasitism. Um, and when I say drunk, I mean we go into these trances of um, our nervous system sort of gets triggered and we go elsewhere and we're not fully present with ourselves and with other people. And so you have this, quote, noise that is making it, making the work hard, you know, this, this work of doing the inner work and finding my, my value. Well, I have to, like, be really intentional about that uh, because there's all of this noise and the world pushes you in a totally different direction. And I think that this is something that all, you know, great, quote, teachers, from Socrates to Martin Luther King to John Lewis to Kant, uh, you know, are dealing with the, this this phenomenon. So, yeah, I think that, you know, social media, like we're, we're in a we're in a domain where there's so many messages that, like, how many likes you have and um, like are people clicking on my thing uh, that that sort of like my, my sense of value is coming from that. And that's where worth is. Um, And this tradition says absolutely not. Well, real quick, uh, I think that there's a danger of, you know, taking the same sort of parasitic, idea and just kind of like pivoting and like taking the parasite mentality and clamping it on to like (laughs) the divine and whatever that is and like expecting Mm. this you know I think there's there's a danger there too it's just more subtle and so you know like dogmatism like that kind of thing exactly ideology Mm. is is basically Mm. what's going on there you know you're worshipping some kind of Thing, and then you're starting to use that to justify your own activities and your own self-worth, which turns into a crazy feedback loop. So, you know, the, the idea is, like, at Bedrock, we're dealing with individuals whose worth and self-worth have to be determined by themselves, and that requires that they have the framework to do that, to build up the prerequisite knowledge and have this sort of internal library whereupon you can judge yourself in a way that's judicious. Mm. Mm. <laughs> and there's like there's an enormous degree of complexity to all of that. So that's I don't know. Yeah. That's just a, a note. Yeah, you have to have, you know, a a sufficiently built up inventory of um uh, you know, so Marcus Aurelius, Aristotle, they talk about the importance of, you know, examples other voices, if you will, um, but 
you know, examples that you can can call on. And uh, fittingly, uh, we've sort of been going for an hour, and so I'll just open it up to one last thing before we sort of transition back to the golden rule. That is the ship, not the principal, and the book. <laughs> so anybody else on this? Parasitism is dangerous if, <laughs> if applied in a certain way or anything else. I really appreciated the discussion from my own personal standpoint since I am still rather new to this whole like realm and domain of intellectual thinking. And so Kant is definitely not someone I am well versed in yet. But no, I like you just everything that the three of you have just mentioned and talked about, I was sort of, you know, sitting back, reflecting and, you know, applying how like how much individuals around the entire world need to undergo this individual like this very internal individual work and then you just look back and say, Oh my good lord, there is so much work left to be done. So no, I greatly mm. appreciated it. Yeah. Cool. Taylor, any last words before we pivot towards closing out today's dialogue? Oh, um yeah, I would just say I think it's so important this idea of connecting that inner work to oneself. And, but using that, you know, self-reflection to just um, make substantial political change. And I, I, I really mm. want to re-highlight the point that Randy made about, you know, at a certain point you can do all this inner work, um, but you need to um, put it out there. And that's like the next step of the inner work. And like that's what, you know, the inner loss says uh, mm. to kind of like put that light out there. Cool. So uh, we will end with uh, some, you know, food for thought. And um, the link to the book, The Golden Rule, is on our show resources page from last week. Um, So you can check it out there. But The Golden Rule, as we said, is a little sailboat. And uh, there's some wonderful passages in this book that Albert Bigelow wrote. And again, I'll Bert Bigelow worked alongside John Lewis. I'm just going to read them, and, uh, and then we'll say goodbye for this week. So this is on page 269. He says, All of us yearn to clear up the confusion within ourselves. All of us long to end the conflict within ourselves. All of us have a deep, secret, and dominant want. We want a conscientious conviction. That's on the very last page of the book. And so there is, like, even if you don't want to posit a self or an inner judge, uh, as Randy was saying, like, first we have to take a leap of faith that such a thing exists. Um, Kant does. (laughs) Um, Socrates does. But even if you don't want to take that leap of faith, Do you want to take the leap of faith, and is it a leap of faith to say, well, there is this confusion and conflict within? Um, Is that something that, like, you can't, that's an undeniable fact? And then what do you make of that conflict uh, is is the next question. But uh, according to this quote, what we're really after is a conscientious conviction, um, a place where reason kind of settles uh, and and so, yeah, I think Kant's idea of the moral law uh, may be fitting that bill. And lastly, this is on page 268, right before that, what the golden rule said, and by that he means his little ship, was, we are not telling you what to think, but we are saying in the most dramatic way we can that there is a need to think. So I will stop and then just open it up for one last round and then we will go. Anybody? Hmm. I, I just want to say something you say all the time, which is, you know, think till it hurts. Uh, that's a, that's a form of pain, but it's, it's a, uh, it's the kind of pain you learn to like. I don't know. Hmm. All right. And I'll just add to that. And uh, I think that not only is thinking painful, 
but thinking involves sitting with your pain, if that makes sense. So there's like this sort of like intellectual discomfort and this like analytical muscle that hurts when I exercise it. That's one one insight. But I also want to just add that there is like, I call it, you know, the primal void or the pet void, but there's like this pain that everybody has and, you know, best to sit with it um, and and think next to it, if that makes sense. Uh, so I'll just add add that piece. Anybody else? Not even a no. <laughs> Not even no. No? Is there just I silence? Guess. <laughs> Go ahead. Oh no, I have one thing I guess that people could take from you know from the series of dialogues we've had in the past is that you really need to undergo this internal personal work and get comfortable with being uncomfortable in a way mm. that, you know, mm. this is going mm-hmm. to, this is really going to push you outside of any realm of mental intellectual thinking that you've had, or even like in physical things and things such as that. So yeah, definitely like, but this whole process of, you know, you just have to take the first, you have to take the first action. And then if you continue to facilitate it, then, um, habitual practices that this will become mm-hmm. something that will feel more natural, but definitely will feel very foreign at first coming to you know, terms with all of these ideas. But in the end, you will be way stronger and way more wise and all the like because of it. Mm. So you have to be willing to sort of be, I like what you said, be comfortable with discomfort. And, um, and I, I just wanted, you know, as we end say, but just, that just reminds me of our discussion about justice and this idea of pain and discomfort and its connection to justice, um, quay inner work and quay outer work. Anybody else last thoughts? Yeah, I just, I would add one thing and I'm sorry it cut out for a second if it is just already said, but when we talk about um, the, the people on the golden, the golden rule ship, they Said, we're not telling you what to think and it just mm. it connects so clearly back to those ideas of like that inner work being like the first mm. thing you need to do um, you know mm-hmm. we can try as hard as you want in this movement to get people to think um, a certain way but like it has to really start from like the inner self mm. and it's uncomfortable <laughs> alright well there you have it <laughs> That is our insight for today. You have been listening to Virtues of Peace. I think we're going to be off next week, but uh, we'll be back soon. And uh, peace, everybody. Bye-bye.